What I'm going to be talking about today is Cultura. Cultura is a, a specific project that is a useful model for us. But essentially, what I'm trying to access is that question of how to connect your learners with members of another culture and how we can move the learning of culture beyond what it what it has been, which is uh, using uh, uh, facts and uh, sort of employing a trivia approach. Now, uh, let's start with the five C's. Cultures is one of the five C's, and we have already addressed it in lesson six. Sharice gave us lots of examples of uh, cultural activities. But the question is, uh, cultures, it covers big C and little c culture. Many of us may be aware of this distinction where uh, big C culture is the things that are very visible about a culture, festivals, foods, costumes, uh, rituals. Uh, and little c culture is about uh, appropriate behavior. But uh, what's really more than big C and little c culture, what's most useful about the five C's uh, analysis of culture is that now we look at culture as a triangle, uh, products, pra practices, and perspectives. Um, and so the, the culture uh, C here, this, this summary that we see of, of, uh, the, of the five Cs, the culture C tells us through the study of other languages, students gain a knowledge and understanding of the cultures that use that language. And in fact, they cannot truly master the language until they have also mastered the cultural contexts in which the language occurs. Now, that's all very well and good, um, but it, it, there are, there's more to it than there appears to be on the surface. Culture is much more than declarative knowledge. Much of culture is performative knowledge, and even beyond that, it is a window, a way of looking through uh, uh, it's a window through which you view the world. You have, you come from a culture and then you realize, okay, in the target culture, there are these other people. They're looking at me in a culturally conditioned way. Each of us is constrained and, and affected by the cultural milieu that we come from. And our objective is to actually be able to get away, far enough away from our own culture that we can see both cultures clearly without being mired inside our own cultural view. And the, the way that we do this is through comparison. Now, I mentioned big C and little c culture. A lot of that has to do with products and practices. The practices may be very subtle. Uh, it may include things such as proxemics. How close can you stand to another person without being rude? Uh, why should you, uh, you know, you need to be careful about showing the soles of your feet to another person, pointing the soles of your feet at another person. Those, those are very uh, subtle, culturally motivated practices, but um, still, we, they are things that we can observe. What, what is hard to observe is perspectives. Perspectives uh, are what motivate uh, the products and the practices. They are, it's the cultural, uh, attitudes that, that underlie. Now, most of the time, these are quite invisible to us. Particularly, our own perspective is invisible to us because we are using that perspective to, to look through and see other cultures. So, uh, here we, we, uh, you know, I think this, uh, uh, iceberg metaphor has, has appeared a number of times. The things that are easily visible to us are above the surface of the water. Those big sea and somewhat little, some of the little sea practices are fairly uh, apparent to us. The things that are not apparent to us are the notions and concepts. So as we go down, we see notions of modesty, notions of beauty, concept of self, concept of past and future. These things vary culturally, but they're not very accessible to us because they belong to deep culture. They're primarily out of awareness. The way that we can observe these things is through a process of comparison. Now, one tool that can help us a great deal in approaching this 
process of comparison is uh, another one of the five C's, which is comparisons. Uh, the, the use of comparisons has been integrated into this document, the 21st Century Skills Map. Now, this is not the first time that you're seeing this document. It was developed together by ACTFL, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, and the uh, I believe it's called the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, uh, p21.org, and, and uh, in fact, you can find this 21st Century Skills Map at the p21.org website and at the ACTFL website. Also, we will link to it. Uh, so in terms of uh, learning culture, uh, this document describes a number of activities that allow students to see, to back away from their own cultural bias and, and compare. The, the 21st Century Skills document compares ways that we learned culture in the traditional classroom and ways that using the 21st century skills we, we learn today. So in the past, the textbook formed the backbone of our curriculum, but now we're able to use thematic units and authentic resources that we can gather from the web or we can gather from uh, interviewing other people. And one of the themes that we can focus on is culture. We can take culture as our object of analysis use the target language and uh, talk about culture as, a, as an object. In the past, we, our language learning took place in the classroom, and today we are trying to find ways for learners to use language and acquire language beyond the classroom. That's part of this 21st century skills map. In the past, students would turn in work for the teacher. Essentially, students were publishing to an audience of one, the teacher, while today, we want students to share and publish to audiences more than the teacher. We want them to use the language for real purposes. Now, all of these, these differences in the way that we taught culture in the past and the way that we teach it today in light of these 21st century skills map, these differences can be exploited. We can use them to, uh, to design our projects and uh, give students access to that cultural knowledge. So in the past, basically, we were treating cultural information as a set of isolated facts and information that students would master, much like they might master historical facts. While today, we want students to recognize that there's a relationship among the perspectives, practices, and products of the culture. In other words, we see certain cultural practices and products because there are certain motivations that come out of that the culture. Okay, so I think that we've established this idea that through comparisons and contrasts with the language being studied, students can develop insight into the nature of language and the concept of culture, and realize that there are multiple ways of viewing the world. When uh, in this quote, when they say the nature of language, that is a little bit deep. I don't think that we're going to be asking our students to uh, speak analytically about the nature of language itself, but uh, more on the order of does a certain word that you think means the same thing in the two languages really mean the same thing? And you begin to realize there are no exact dictionary equivalents across languages. Language is mutable and culturally conditioned. And the same with the concept of culture. It's more than just costumes it is a, a, a worldview, a way of viewing the world. Now, um, there is a very powerful model for developing cultural awareness that I'm going to tell you about today, and that is the Cultura model. This was developed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1990s. It's called Cultura, and Cultura is still going. Uh, it still forms the basis for third-level French classes at MIT. And uh, you can find out more about Cultura at this website, cultura.mit.edu. But I'm going to give you uh, the basic outlines of how Cultura works today. Uh, as, by way of background, uh, Cultura started as a means of fostering telecollaborative exchange between students at MIT and students in France who were at Grande École or universities in France 
with the idea that uh, while both sides had learned about one another's cultures, they didn't really have that deep access, that deep knowledge. And so the creators of Cultura were looking for a way to, to get at that knowledge through, a, through this process of exchange. These are, are the three uh, creators of Cultura. Gilbert Furstenberg, who's now retired, Sabine Levé, who is still teaching at MIT, and Shogi Warren, who taught at MIT back in the 90s and then later moved to Brown University. Uh, I'm sorry to report that he died one year ago today. Today is the first anniversary of his death. So um, in Cultura, the idea is that cultural norms can be made visible through contrast, just like we were already talking about. Also, Cultura places culture at the center of the curriculum so that language teaching and learning is really about, it, it's, a, it's a means for learning about culture. Culture is really what we want to get at. And that this cultural knowledge, knowledge will emerge not because the teacher has a list of things that the teacher is going to tell the students, but the things that the students are going to discover when they engage in shared reflection with members of the target culture. So uh, this shared reflection, this process of, of going through a telecollaborative exchange with the, say, the students in France, from MIT, the language that the students are studying actually comes out of that exchange. They don't start with a textbook. They start with the actual exchange and the, the things that are said in the exchange by the French side, that becomes the language that they deal with in the classroom. The end result is that students not only learn about the target culture, they also begin to realize how culturally conditioned their own viewpoints are, and they learn about themselves. So it, the cultura really is like a mirror that is held up to yourself. You learn about both sides. The first culture, C1, and C2, the second culture, the target culture. All right, so I'm going to give you an example. This is made up by me. This is not uh, an actual historical uh, example of uh, cultura exchange, but this could be a good starting point. The first step in a cultura exchange is always observing and recording differences in an online forum. So let's say the MIT students and the students from France are online together. They are presented with two culturally uh, significant objects. One is from the US and one is from France. And they're invited to look at, observe differences and record them in the forum using their own language. So the American students are posting in English and the French students are posting in French. In essence, they are providing one another with linguistic resources that are authentic and native. This use of the, the native language in the forum is one of the most distinctive characteristics of cultura. But that's not to say that it's written in stone. There have been many adaptations of the cultura model which have chosen to use differing configurations for language. For example, uh, there was a Russian exchange that uh, I helped to coordinate in which the two sides agreed they would use Russian for two weeks and then English for two weeks. Russian for two weeks, English for two weeks as they, as they went through their exchange. However, uh, it's important to note the chief advantage of using the, the native language in the forum is that you can, the, it's easy for students to express exactly what they want to express and what they are expressing is culturally and linguistically authentic material for the other side rather than learner language. All right, so um, during this uh, first task when they're observing and recording differences, the, they might uh, observe the physical uh, appearance of two different objects, uh, looking at these two milk bottles, one from the US and one from France. Uh, we notice a difference in size, a difference in material, uh, the students might start guessing about some of the, the language that they see on the label. Uh, and then the students might start inferring things. Uh, for example, the French student uh, who's posted here says, it looks like Americans uh, drink a lot more milk at one time than the French do, and then is asking about the color blue on the label, is that significant? Uh, 
Now, this is just a beginning, and uh, this is just the first task. They're going to carry this exchange further, and they're going to dig deeper, but they're beginning at a very physical level. Now, here we have two objects that are, each one is from uh, one of the two cultures, but it doesn't have to be a comparison of objects. In Cultura, often they will have students view uh, movies that are remakes of one another. So Sai told us that there was a very famous adaptation of Romeo and Juliet that was a Bollywood film. So you might ask students to watch Baz Luhrmann's adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, which is set in an American cultural milieu, and then watch the, the Bollywood adaptation uh, of the Romeo and Juliet story and observe differences between the films. They could range from anything from costumes to the who you meet in the family, the role of family. You could take it so many different directions. And with this uh, milk comparison, the students may take it further as we, as we go along. The second task is to examine, clarify, and discuss the second language material from the online forum discussion. Let me rephrase this. This means that having done the online exchange, which does not take place during class time, but is done during homework time, the students go back to the classroom and they grab language that was in the exchange. It's brought to class and the students go through that language. They are working in the target language in class. So at MIT, they would be speaking French and they would be talking about those French language postings that appeared in their discussion about the comparison of the milk bottles. Some of the objectives that, that they would try to achieve during class would be to form hypotheses regarding the differences between the objects that they've been comparing. Why are those differences there? Why is the French milk bottle smaller? They, they, they will generate a number of these hypotheses. They may work with vocabulary, trying to find uh, groups of synonyms, antonyms, maybe separating words from the exchange into parts of speech, uh, learning conjugations of irregular verbs, any kind of linguistic uh, questions that come up, they can work with those in different ways. Uh, a, a good way to process the meanings that have emerged is to ask the students to summarize the things that they saw in the exchange. How did the exchange go? Please tell us in French what happened, what, what comparisons people were talking about. This way, the students are taking that second language that they got from the exchange, and but they also have to include what happened in their own language in the exchange and try to express that in the second language. So this is the place where they're really doing that language work. They don't need to practice their language when they are in the exchange with the other students. They practice the language in the classroom. Uh, you can break the students down into research groups to do, to do these tasks. And uh, students may engage in debate. Uh, it looks like I'm uh, on my own machine. I'm seeing, oh, there we go. Okay, it's come along. <laughs> it took a little bit for the, the presentation to catch up. Uh, so you can, you, they might try these various uh, things in class. One of the most important things is they're going to take questions back into their next task, which also takes place in the forum, where they're going one level deeper and trying to ask, say, the French uh, partners, do you think this is because, and, and testing their hypotheses that they have formed. So this third task is they're back in the forum outside of class time, and they're asking each other, uh, it looks like the French side here is, does it seem to you that Americans do their shopping more seldom than the French do? Uh, is the large size of the milk uh, related to the infrequency of, of shopping? And the American side is saying, how many bottles of this size would a French family of four buy during one trip to the market? How many times a week would this family go to the market? So they're pushing for more detail, trying to explore the differences and the reasons, possible reasons for the differences. All right. Finally, they are going to go back to class and they're going to summarize and discuss their findings in the target language. Remember, in class, they're working with that target language. They're going to try to extend their findings into theories of cultural perspectives. So the perspectives were invisible 
but the students formed hypotheses about those perspectives and they took those those hypotheses to the forum and tested them. Now they're back in class trying to summarize the their what they found, a theory of the cultural perspective differences. Now, the differences that they have found can be used as a starting point, a springboard to design further activities for the exchange. So if, if the students, you know, this depends on what the teacher wants and what the students want, but basically you can take this milk discussion and extend it into health, cuisine, uh, spending habits, shopping habits, uh, the use of resources, wastefulness, how much food is wasted, all of these topics are, are possible for a, another stage. So looking at Cultura, the, this brief summary that I've given, how does Cultura match PBLL? Is, is it a good match? It looks like it is because you could use an exchange of this type within the context of a larger project. The exchange can accommodate a driving question. You can be discussing the, the cultural comparison of the objects that you are doing can be under the umbrella of your driving question. So for example, if, if, you're, if this is a health-related project where you're examining uh, public health or uh, you know, common illnesses, things like that, then you might examine pictures of doctor's offices in the two countries or maybe pictures of cultural habits that aren't so healthy. Uh, so for example, um, in the West, uh, it's not usual for people to reach into a common dish with their own utensil that they've had in their mouth. In other cultures, it is common, so you could compare and contrast those things. Um, and all of the other eight of the eight essential features of PBLL can be supported by this cultura model. The need to know student voice and choice because the discussion in the forums is entirely student driven. In the classic cultura model, the teacher does not intervene in the discussion. If there is conflict, the students are left to work it out and then that is treated as material, as, as fodder for class. When you go back to class, you reflect on what happened, what went right, what went wrong it's possible for things to go wrong. This is certainly a kind of in-depth inquiry because this cultural comparison brings out those, those perspectives that we're trying to get at. Um, critique and revision is accommodated because, as I showed you, it's an iterative process. You're going to go through several stages of exchange. The two sides could be working towards a common project goal, but in different languages, and their critique and revision could be incorporated into their exchanges that take place. Finally, it's plain that this is a 21st century competency-friendly method because not only are the students using 21st century technology, but in class, when they bring that linguistic material back to class, they themselves are investigating fresh, authentic source material and uh, with the support of the teacher, they're analyzing it and uh, forming their own learning. And a lot of that is going to be group-based. The biggest question is whether uh, the exchange will accommodate significant content. Uh, and I think the answer is if you make it significant, if you choose content that is quite significant, then it will be. Um, the reason I put a question mark here is because my example compared a large and a small milk bottle from different countries, which seems trivial. My point is that you can uh, push the exchange, you can encourage the students to ask, ask, ask why and form hypotheses about cultural differences. If you do that, then you're definitely getting at significant content. Because cultural differences cause a lot of the friction in the world, a lot of our problems in, you know, uh, among nations are due to these differences in perspective. And what we're doing is we're uncovering the differences and realizing, hey, I have a certain perspective. And that's usually what's missing is that people don't see that they are wearing certain cultural uh, glasses, as it were. And finally, the question of a public audience is something that I don't think the Cultura model in its classic form really addresses. You're not taking these, there's no provision in classic cultura 
for students to take their findings and present them to the world at large. However, it is possible to consider that a cultura type exchange between two classes, two groups of people, could use the other side as their audience. All right. So uh, going ahead, uh, back to this uh, 21st century skills map. Uh, we're going to link to this document, and I would like to encourage you to look at pages 17 and 18, where there are several social and cross-cultural skills uh, activities proposed in the novice level column, the intermediate level column, and the advanced level column, and to think about what kind of adaptations would you make to these activities in order to bring them in line with PBLL, to be used in a PBLL project, and to be used in a cultura type exchange. All right, so um, in the end, you may end up uh, using a cultura type model that will provide your group of students whose second culture is some, uh, some other, uh, you know, speaks some other language. These are your students for whom the second culture is Espanol, for example, and join them with this other group of students whose second culture is English, and, and you serve as their cultural informant. You're comparing products and practices, and you're theorizing about perspectives and testing those hypotheses that you make. All right, so uh, it looks like my time is very much up, and so I'm going to leave it there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. This is Jimmy Oshioka, and I have some questions for you. Uh, first question is, could you please elaborate a bit on how Cultura is adapted scaffold or scaffolded differently for beginner versus advanced level learners, or is it intended mainly for learners who are already beyond the beginner level? Yes, plainly. Uh, the, the model that I showed, uh, the, say the milk bottles comparison, is going to require an intermediate level of proficiency if the students are left on their own in an, in an unstructured discussion and, and are asked to compare and contrast what they see. Um, if you wanted to take it down to a beginning level, then you would definitely have to adapt the classic cultura model so that the teacher would be involved in the discussion and would prompt uh, both sides to with questions. I would imagine that the teacher could jump into the forum and start asking questions of the students. So let's take this milk bottle comparison. Now the students that uh, were in my example were advanced enough to sort of undertake the comparison and contrast on their own. But if you were, uh, if you asked the two groups uh, to come into a forum in real time, supervised by the teacher, so you'd be using class time for this presumably, if uh, you could manage to coordinate with your partners. And the teacher would ask questions like, um, uh, are both bottles uh, the same color? Uh, or uh, which bottle is bigger? You know, you can, you can bring the language down to uh, an, a beginning level and ask students to make those observations, but with that scaffolding from the teacher. In general, however, Cultura is designed for second year and above, and at MIT, we're talking about third year uh, French classes that use it. Okay, the next question is, uh, would the instructors come up with the prompts, or are there sample prompts in the Cultura program for instructors to use? My answer to that would be, uh, we need to think of our own prompts using backward design. So if we have a PBLL project in mind, we're going to try to find two objects that uh, fit with our project and ask the students to compare those. Uh, there are plenty of examples at cultura.mit.edu uh, of, in, and in fact, they are archived discussions between uh, of uh, students in, in two countries doing various kinds of comparisons. Um, one really great tool that Cultura offers is instead of comparing pictures of two milk bottles or two different versions of the same movie, they ask students to generate objects themselves to be compared, and here's how they do it. They ask students in the United States, for example, to give word associations that they have with 
a certain word. So say, for example, doctor. What words, what three words come to mind when you hear the word doctor? And then they take the same word that is the dictionary translation of that word in the other language, and they ask that group of students to respond in their native language. What three words do you think of when you hear the word doctor? Of course, in French, it would be, I don't know, uh, is it doctor or anyway, physician. Uh, and they come up with, with their list of associations. All of those word associations are put out for the students to view, and they start to see big differences between those two lists of words. That's, those are the differences that they compare and contrast. So um, since that's at, at a word level, what you're seeing is lists of words, that might be suitable for lower level students. Mm -hmm.